Welcome to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. I'm your spicy host, Tara, and I'm here every episode to expose, uncover, and share what I know about SEX. This isn't what you'll find in a typical sex ed class. Juicy sex talk is under discussed, and I'm doing what I can to change that. Sex is evolving. People are empowered more than ever to detach from cultural norms and design the sex life they crave. And hey, if you're looking for more after the show, I invite you to get social. My Instagram is the.sexed.show, and I'd love for you to give me a follow. Today's exploration is one that will awaken your senses and reconnect you with the primal rhythms of nature. We are diving deep into the lush world of eco-sexuality with my incredible guest, Salaz, a fellow somatic sex educator and sexological body worker. In this conversation, we'll embark on a journey to define and explore the concept of eco-sexuality, unraveling its profound connection to somatic experiences and pleasure. Join us as we discuss the sensual dance with nature, exploring practices and rituals that embody eco-sexual principles. Discover the role of somatic sex education in eco-sexual ex exploration, tongue twister, and how embodiment plays a crucial role in the context of eco-sexuality. Get ready to tune in and be embraced by the soothing whispers of nature as we explore eco-sexuality through the lens of somatic wisdom. And in honoring the spirit of this conversation... I recognize I'm situated on the traditional lands of Treaty 7 territory. These lands are steeped in the histories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, as well as the Sutina Nation and Stony Nakoda Nations. The Métis Nation of Alberta adds to the vibrant tapestry of this territory. As we explore the profound connections between nature, sensuality, and the somatic experience, let's remain mindful of the enduring relationship between these lands and their original custodians. And before we get into introducing Salaz, she has volunteered to do a somatic inquiry for today's show. So thank you, Salaz. Woo! <laughs> thank you for having me. <laughs> this is exciting as usual. And yes, I'd love to uh, start by asking our listeners to tune into their body. Um, first, taking a deep breath together and really feeling that breath. And as it lands into our stomach, expanding our stomach and our rib cage. Deep inhale here. And as we exhale, feeling our rib cage hug our hearts. And wherever you are right now in the world, I know that Tara is in a much colder place than I am. I am in beautiful sunny Hawaii. So right now my window is open and I'm feeling the breeze coming through and caressing my face. Might not be the case for everyone. So I'd like for you to feel the sensations that um, the weather is bringing to you right now. If it's cold, you might be wrapped up in a blanket or snuggling into your, your sweater, all snuggled up in your sweater and just feel that sensation of being held and, and warmed up by the material surrounding your skin and your body. And if you are in a warmer place like me wearing shorts and a t-shirt how does that feel for you how does your body feel how does your skin feel being exposed to the air around you and the warmth of the weather and tuning for another deep breath and slowly exhale Thank you very much for participating into this somatic inquiry. I hope you felt wonderful sensations. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that, Salaz. You're very um, welcome. So you mentioned you're tuning in from Hawaii today. Yeah. So that's where you call home. Absolutely. Yeah. So I don't know if everybody listening would know that. 
Is there anything else you want to share about yourself before we kind of jump into this whole, what is eco-sexuality conversation? Yeah. Well, I live on this beautiful uh, land that is um, the island of Oahu, Hawaii. I occupy this land, I would say. I am not originally from here. So I want to acknowledge that, that this land belongs to the Tanaka Maoli. And, um, you know, I have the privilege of being here and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I very much, yes, enjoy living on this land and calling it my home. Mm -hmm. And I'm a somatic sex educator and sexological body worker here. Um, the only one so far. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, and ecosexuality is a big part of your life. You embody it in a, a, a lot of different aspects from work to play. And when I kind of brought this question into my Instagram, because I asked people, what questions do you have about ecosexuality? Every single question I received was, what is it? Mm -hmm. So I know it's kind of a loaded question, but maybe would you be able to kind of explain what you think ecosexuality is? Yes. Of course, it is actually a relatively new and evolving concept. Um, and it's understanding and acceptance vary, of course, depending on the individuals that you talk to or the communities that you live in, um, because it really represents a unique perspective on human sexuality and the relationships between humans and the environment. Um, it, really emphasizes the interconnectedness and mm -hmm. the interdependence of all living beings, basically. And that's a um, term that emerged uh, in the early 2000s. So it's fairly new. And wow. it's, mm -hmm, yeah, I think it's 2004. Um, wow. And it's often associated, not, not to say that it did not exist before, but I think there was the, 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 word in itself was not used but i'm sure the concept and like people already embodied uh ecosexuality sensuality uh, before 2000 but it is associated with the broader environmental and ecological movements um led by annie sprinkle and beth stephens um who both um really challenged traditional boundaries of human sexuality by expanding the definition of what can be considered an object of desire. So they don't mm -hmm. focus um, or as ecosexual people, ecosexual people, we don't solely focus on other individuals. We also direct our affection towards the natural world, um, you know, recognizing the importance of its inherent beauty. So um, we kind of have a, a love story with nature, basically. <laughs> I was going to say, it kind of sounds like getting horny for nature. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Getting um, turned on by nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And if you want, I can share. Um, so Annie Sprinkle and um, her partner, Beth Stephens, actually wrote uh, an eco-sensual manifesto that I think really describes as best what eco-sensuality is about. So if you're open to it, I can share it. Yeah, I love that. Okay. So here's the manifesto, eco-sex manifesto. Number one, we are the eco-sexuals. The earth is our lover. We are madly, passionately, and fiercely in love. And we are grateful for this relationship each and every day in order to create a more mutual and sustainable relationship with the earth. We collaborate with nature. We treat the earth with kindness, respect, and affection. Number two, we make love with the earth. 
we are aquaphils, terophils, pyrophils, or pyrophils, and aerophils. I'm sorry if I say this wrong with my French um, accent. We shamelessly hug trees, massage the earth with our feet, and talk erotically to plants. We are skinny dippers, sun worshippers, and stargazers, yes. <laughs> we caress rocks and pleasure, are pleasured by waterfalls mm -hmm, and admire the earth curves often. We make love with the earth through our senses. We celebrate our e-spots. We are very dirty. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. We are a rapidly growing global community of ecosexuals. This community includes artists, academics, sex workers, sexologists, healers, environmental activists, nature fetishists, gardeners, business people, therapists, lawyers, peace activists, eco-feminists, scientists, educators, revolutionaries, creators, and other entities from diverse walk of life. Some of us are sexology, sexologists researching and exploring the places where sexology and ecology intersect in our culture. As consumers, we aim to buy less. When we must, we, we buy green, organic, and local. Whether on farms, at sea, in the woods, or in small towns or large cities, we connect and empathize with nature. Number five, we are ecosex activists. We will save the mountains, waters, and skies by any means necessary, especially through love, joy, and our powers of seduction. We will stop the rape, abuse, and the poisoning of the earth. We do not condone the use of violence, although we recognize that some ecosexuals may choose to fight those most guilty for destroying the earth with public disobedience, anarchist and radical environmental activist strategies. We embrace the revolutionary tactics of art, music, poetry, humor, and sex. We work and play tirelessly for earth justice and global peace. Bombs hurt. Ecosexual is an identity. For some of us, ecosexual is our primary sexual identity, whereas for others, it is not. Ecosexuals can be LGBTQI, heterosexual, asexual, and or other. We invite and encourage ecosexuals to come out. We are everywhere. We are polymorphous and pollen amorous. We educate people about ecosex culture, community, and practices. We hold this truth to be self-evident that we are all part of, not separate from nature. Thus, all sex is ecosex. And then they have an ecosex pledge. I promise to love, honor, and cherish you, Earth, until death brings us closer together forever. Mm. Beautiful. That's so special. So beautiful. Yeah. Uh. I really uh, abide by this manifesto. So I hope that gives everyone a clear idea of what being an ecosensual person is all about. Yeah. I mean, like processing that as you were reading it, you know, I always found nature to be very sensual and probably I learned more of how erotic it was as I was enrolled with the ISSE and doing my training. It's like, wow, yeah, like nature is actually really erotic. But how horny nature can make me. Uh huh. Yeah. Like, really, from seeing like a really powerful river in the mountains to just seeing like I have a, a clear, clear bluebird sky in front of my window right now. And like the color is just, it's mm -hmm. hot. It's just mm -hmm. sexy. It's so sexy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you have the capacity to feel for that because you are so much sex educator. Mm -hmm. A lot of, a lot of people, um, don't have the somatic experiences that we have. They don't understand how to tune into their sensation. They're not aware of their sensations. And so therefore they cannot connect to nature the same way. So that's when, you know, somatic sex education comes handy. And that's when, you know, I see the value of the work that we do by, you know, bringing that awareness um, uh, to, uh, to life within our clients, you know, mm -hmm. and helping them 
you know, feel their physical sensations, but also their emotions, you know? Mm -hmm. And when you're able to tap into your body and your sensations the way we do, then it's a lot easier to go into nature and, and feel that when we're in nature and connect to the earth and connect to the elements mm -hmm. and have that erotic experience. Yeah, like gardening and having your hands ah. in the dirt oh. and it's like a hot day and your hands are all cool and it's just like... I mean, it's not like I'm getting a lady boner over here, but it definitely has a sense of aliveness and yes. eroticism to it. Uh -huh. yeah. um, and to be honest, I never really heard about ecosexuality until I had started with my trainings. And we were talking about this earlier and you said you were kind of the same, like you always thought nature was erotic. Like you said, you had some experiences when you were younger. Do you want to share that? Yeah, I'd love to share that. Yeah. Yeah, I've always felt super close to nature and I've always had so many sensations while in nature. So yeah, when when I was a young girl, um, I grew up right outside of Paris and there's a lot of forests in this region. And one of our weekend activities with my family was to go walk through the forest. Um, and, you know, and we'd pick up like chestnuts or pine cones or bellflowers. Oh, I love the bellflowers um, or lilies, depending on the season. Uh, but I always love to take some moss home with me. Like I have I have like I have deep love. I have a deep love for moss. So me too. <laughs> It must be a Gemini thing. <laughs> oh, it must be a Gemini thing. Oh, Moss just like turns me on so much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> was, yes. I just love how soft it is and like how it feels on my, on my hand and on my skin. Ah, so, um, but yeah, I remember always having a feeling of like, first of all, being free when I was in nature, but also feeling like I was a part of it. And, you know, and like how the majesty of the trees made me feel like safe and protected and like they almost appeared like, and they still do, um, like wise ancestors to me, mm -hmm. you know, the mm -hmm. tree. But they also have like kind of like this, um, they, they, you know, we can also look at trees as like a, a phallic metaphor, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, I always had that awareness of like how trees like, made me feel you know um I remember how the smells and textures also like vary like depending on the seasons like you know and and how the ground fell under my feet like you know hard cold and dry in the winter and crunchy and crisp in the fall and then often muddy and with a grassy fragrance in the spring and then parched and sun-kissed in the summer and so um, I don't have those season seasonal experiences anymore in Hawaii because it's warm all the time. But yeah. I do remember those, you know, sensations from when I grew up um, during different seasons and how how they were different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then I moved to Germany when I was 20. And when I was in Germany, I was alone a lot. So I would go like on solo trips either by car, I was like in my little Peugeot 205 <laughs> or, <laughs> or by bike. And I would just go explore on my own. And I remember that um, it was there, it was in Germany that I felt a sense of like spiritual bliss for the first time when I was in nature. I really vividly remember it. And everywhere like I'd go, I felt like I had a conversation with spirit. Mm. Um, and to this day, I feel the same. Like when I go to nature, that's always where I feel like the most connected to spirit as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, now I have the privilege to live on the beautiful sacred lands of the Kanaka Maui, as I said. And my current living situation allows me to be in closeness with nature like every single day. Like, I mean, what a privilege. Mm -hmm. um, and even if you came to my place, to my house, like I have like a huge tree. I have two actually, but like one of them is right by, you know, the where you have to go to enter my house. So it's, and the shape of it, it's literally like, I call it um, a portal because every time I go through that tree, I feel like I'm entering a portal. Mm. And then 
when you walk, there's like a little, there's a short path to lead to, that leads to my entrance door. And along the path, there's the path, there's like plants lined up on each side to mm-hmm. welcome you to my house. So I bring nature right at the footstep of my house. Like I love nature so much that I can't imagine not having like those plants and this tree in front of my house. I don't know mm-hmm. if you remember, but um, I think it was about a year and a half ago, my landlord decided to cut, to chop down that tree. It's massive. It's huge. And um, the, the, the tree trimmers like really cut it super low. And Tara, I cried for two weeks. I was grieving that tree so much. It felt like my heart felt so empty and I felt like I had like lost uh, a lover. Like yeah. I was like, it was awful. And uh, ah, guess what? With all the love and all the prayers and it grew back and it's twice as large as it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm so happy because I, it was really a devastating like experience to not see that tree standing in front of my, in front of my place anymore and um I just love nature so much I just don't like nature to be hurt so Mm -hmm. yeah because it's like a lover yeah like what you said yeah open my I have like clovers at my house you know it's not like plain windows so you know I look outside of my louvers and I see the tree right there and I can hear like the breeze coming through or Mm -hmm. sometimes get here and I hear like the branches dance together and you know I you know I in the morning the morning I wake into the birds singing um and when it rains I can enjoy that the music of the rain as it crashes on the alphat and the dirt of the lawn I mean it's to me it's so much pleasure that I could not experience if I lived in a in a different place you know than here or even in an apartment building, I always say I'm so grateful. I'm so I feel I'm very privileged. I have to say that again. I know that. Uh, I I can relate with that. I currently my house backs on to an old park. It's an old golf course that isn't in use anymore. And it's just sitting there. The city doesn't own it, so nothing's been done with it. And it's just getting more and more wild. But there's hundreds of poplar trees. And in the summer, when all the leaves are there and the breeze comes through, it literally sounds like an ocean with waves crashing onto sand or onto pebbles. It's very loud, um, but it also attracts a lot of wildlife. It's every client that comes to my house is like, oh, my God, the view from your window is incredible. And I'm like, I can't move like I could never leave this space because it's so special to have this huge amount of nature literally in our backyard, like so lucky, so privileged to have that. And it's what's kept me in this house for seven years. (laughs) Yeah, it sounds magical. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the way I feel about my place. And I dread the day I will have to move because I know at some point I will. Mm -hmm. Um, but same, like when my clients come to my house and uh, we have a session and they lie on the table, they're lying down on the table and all of a sudden there is a, a gush of wind and they hear the trees and they hear the birds and it adds on to the somatic awareness that, oh, we're, yeah. that we're bringing to them. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's really sensational as Coco would put it, one of our mentors. It is sensational. It yeah. is. I, yeah. I, this summer I had a client who came for a session and I, in the summer I leave the window open cause I don't have AC it gets pretty hot and a storm came up and you could hear all of the trees like out back. Mm-hmm. You could hear the rain starting to come and I'm doing an erotic massage on this client. And I was like, you are in for a treat. Like the, you could <laughs> smell the rain And she was just like, wow, this is a very heightened experience than other sessions I've had with you. And I'm like, yeah, this is, it's, it definitely adds to the, the vibe. Yes. 
Yeah, I love it when nature speaks to us this way. Mm. Yeah. I'm curious, like, how how does, like, eco-sexuality break down barriers and taboos that, you know, normative people or normative practices tend to to have? Mm-hmm. Well, um, I mean, I feel like, as I said earlier, it's such a new concept. It's such a new way of uh, life that um, there's still a lot of uh, people who don't get it. And um, I know that I've been called weird by others and I don't care. (laughs) But my goal is to offer these experiences to my clients. So that is how I am working on breaking down the taboos and the barriers. Um, Because, you know, when we think about it, there's nothing wrong with finding pleasure and fulfillment and fulfillment by engaging our senses and connecting with nature. That, that's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to be confined in, uh, in, in, in a tower, in a, in a cement tower all day, you know? Uh, we're not supposed to walk with boots all day or shoes, yeah? We're, we're supposed to be outdoors, experiencing nature, walking barefoot in nature Mm -hmm. um and you know we can we are meant to experience the textures the smells the sounds and the sights of the environment yeah anybody has this um uh, availability to them i mean not everybody i take that back but um you know anyone who goes outside and wants to have an experience with a tree you know go feel and touch a tree bark Mm-hmm. Go smell the scent of flowers, you know, just finger listening. a flower, finger flower. Yeah, <laughs> don't, don't hurt her, don't hurt her, but yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, listen to the rustling of leaves, mm-hmm. witness the beauty of a sunset mm-hmm. if, if it's available to you. You know, it's like, very counter normative, it's to... very counter normative. It's not a lot of people think about that. Yeah. And we're not really, we don't live in a society that nurtures that relationship with nature either, because that essentially goes against capitalism. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I wrote, um, so for my final project at the Institute, um, so Tara and I, um, I've studied at the same institute for three years or so now, the Somali, the Institute for the Studies of Somatic Sex Education. And at the end of our training, we have a project um, that we need to submit. And my project is a correlation between uh, colonialism and um, col- colonialism of the land, but also colonialism of the female body. So I talk a lot about that, about capitalism in that project, uh, patriarchy and how- Colonization, yeah. Because I've lived um, in Hawaii for almost 18 years now. But the first time I came here was 27 years ago, maybe 28 years ago now. And I have seen so much change. And- they continue building high-rise buildings every day. There's a there's you know um, cranes up, and and it's it's disgusting to me. It's like taking away the beauty of the land, and um, and taking away that accessibility that we should have to nature. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's you know I'm glad you bring that up because it is it is very hurtful to nature and it hurts my soul like that's mm-hmm. how deeply I feel for nature yeah, yeah. and oh, that's what makes ecosexuality such a taboo kind of mm-hmm. thought thought is because we're not really encouraged to find nature sexy because if we mm-hmm. found sex sexiness or turn on or eroticism in nature it would be more challenging to colonize the land. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And 
And the reality too is you don't have to be in nature to experience ecosexuality too. One thing that I saw in our mm-hmm. studies with ecosexuality was Annie Sprinkles. I think it was Annie Sprinkles. It might have been somebody else now that I think of it, but they went out to the grocery store or market, I guess, and mm. they bought, you know, zucchini and cucumbers and all of these vegetables. And then she fucked herself with the vegetables. <laughs> and then she had friends over for dinner and she served the vegetables that she fucked herself with. And uh-huh. I just thought that was so fucking erotic and hot. I was like, what is going on? I'm just, I'm watching this. Like my jaws just drop. Like what? I didn't know this was a thing. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I have a confession to make. Um <laughs> <laughs> I even bought myself a vibrator and a dildo. I used to masturbate with zucchinis and cucumbers and carrots. So, and I, I again, I had no idea that this was called being an ecosensual person. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, why not? <laughs> it's available. Yeah. It's there. It's, it has the shape. It's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then you can, as you said, then you can cook it and eat it. I've never cooked it for my friends, but after <laughs> doing it, I have for myself. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. 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 This is what an ecosensual person is. You know, we have a deep emotional and erotic connection with nature and attraction and desire towards the earth and, and its ecosystem and all the good things that it provides for us. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's also great. You know, I work with a lot of couples and I feel like if they were to go out in nature more together and awakened their senses to the eroticism available through nature, you know, that's a date night doesn't have to be this huge all expense paid thing Mm -hmm. that you do together. It could be like going on a a hike and just being aware of these things. It could be driving out to the mountains. If that's something close to you for me, it's an hour away and just like getting turned on by nature. It could just be going for a walk together when the sun's setting or the sun's rising and just being more aware of what's going on in your body and how that changes, what shifts, what sensations are coming up um, to really like generate some more sexiness, some more turned onness, some more hotness in your relationship to do that with somebody else too. I just totally, totally. I'm always ready for sex after a sunset. <laughs> always. <laughs> or lying down and looking at the sky at night and looking at the stars. I mean, yeah, that is, it's such a powerful sensation. Yeah. You know, like my body just is overwhelmed with this beautiful vibrations. Yeah. So yeah, I love that idea of like recommending that kind of dates, that kind of date for clients. Yeah. Right. A lot of people, you know, their idea of a date too can be just uh, Netflix, Netflix, Netflix and chill. You know, I mean, what do you get out of that? I don't know. Like, I, it's not appealing to me personally, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was going to say that's why one of my favorite places to go to that's like lifestyle nudist friendly is hedonism in Jamaica. Because Mm -hmm. although it's not like super posh, five star, um, there's a lot of jungle. There's Mm -hmm. a lot of plants. There's a lot of nature that really surrounds this resort. And, you know, half of it is nude mandatory and the other half is nude optional. And that was the first time that I'd really been in public really Mm -hmm. naked 
and being out on the sand, be, swimming in the ocean when you're naked, mm. like what an erotic, mm. like that place just really, it turned me on. Like I, I even said, I'm like, is this resort like built on some, some quartz, like the vibes, <laughs> it's just so hot and the stars at night because there's not as much light pollution. It's just, it's a really sexy atmosphere. And I think I, that's why I love it so much is because there's so much nature and mm -hmm. eroticism ingrained into that resort. Mm -hmm. Oh, that sounds fabulous. I want to go next time. So <laughs> let me know. I'd love to go with you. I yeah. don't know when I'll be able to make it there again, but yeah, it's pretty, it's a pretty special place. And yeah. There's one like, like jungle place and it's, it's a garden or whatever, but it's very wild. I mean, there's also lots of bugs and stuff too, which I, <laughs> bugs are a hard one for me. I come from a cold climate. I'm not used to yeah, I was gonna that are like this stuff. big, <laughs> mm -hmm. but we walked through there and it was very romantic and we're naked and we're like, oh, it was so hot. Mm. Oh, <sighs> can you that yeah well you could have um similar experience if you came to visit in Hawaii <laughs> I know <laughs> uh, I love that what you described about you know going in the ocean and swimming naked like I love doing that here I go to um this beach um on the north shore um every so often and it's so freeing and I'm I crave it when I haven't gone in a while, like I crave it. Like right now I'm ready to go again. Like I'm probably gonna end up going this weekend because I just love to feel the, you know, the wind and the water against my my breasts and against my genitals. And um and also like And the sun. And the sun. Oh my gosh, how could I forget <laughs> about the sun? The sun is my ally. The sun is my ally. It is in my name, Solas. But I love to go to the waterfalls too here and be naked. And the mm. water is so cold. And so it's a completely different experience than going to the ocean, which is warmer here. Um, but yeah, it's so, oof, yes. <laughs> More. <laughs> yeah, I love a good nude beach. We have mm. one here. The water is very cold yeah. as well. Oh. But yeah, it's it's such a... Yeah, it's just a special experience. And just because you're naked in nature doesn't also isn't like it doesn't have to be sexualized. Thank you. Does that make sense? Oh, abs oh, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, I, let's talk I, about that. Let's talk about that. Yes, I was actually thinking about it last night when I when I was going through my notes. Um uh I love that because it's it's a it's um it can be yeah it can be like a, a something major to deal with when going to the nude beach. Um, I've had experiences um, that were unpleasant, um, you know, and um, because I'm not going there to show my body, I'm not going there to show up. I'm not going there to try to find a fuck partner, a fuck buddy. Mm -hmm. I'm going there for my own personal enjoyment and because I love being naked. And this is my favorite way of being. Uh, unfortunately, you will run into, you know, I'm sorry to say, but men who will approach you or look at you a certain way. And that's totally, um, it's, yeah, it creeps me out. Like it's, it's you know, it's, um, it's uh, non-consensual. Um, and, uh, you know, luckily I go with friends and one of my best friends, and so he's a, a, a man. And so mm. most recently when we went, um, we had an experience and, um, he actually went up to the guy and just told him that, you know, it made us very uncomfortable the way he was looking, looking at us. So yeah, um, it's not about being sexual for others. Um, you know? It's it's about feeling good into our bodies, uh, and and maybe feeling that eroticism in ourselves and with nature. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, not calling out any attention like it's not the goal. Yeah, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I think you kind of, yeah, you made a good point there. It's not, a, and th <laughs> this is like the hang up that people get about hedonism 
is they're like, if I go there, I have to be naked if I go on one side of the resort and I'm afraid that I'm just going to be like sexualized and like people are going to be like, oh my God, pounce on you and like staring at your genitals or your breasts. And the reality is it's not even like that, even though it is more of like a sexy lifestyle friendly resort, um, people are very respectful and you basically are talking to them like they have clothes on you know exactly. it's mm-hmm. yeah and yes yeah, yeah yeah it didn't it doesn't feel weird and also like to speak more on that being in a place that is you know nude like pro nudity um you see so many different body types mm-hmm. and i think it really helps to build body image and body confidence when you are looking around and you're like, wow, there's so many different types of bodies and everybody just is enjoying themselves and being themselves. And there's not this like standard of unattainable Mm -hmm. portrayal of what our bodies are supposed to look like because we're so used to seeing that in the media. Uh, And that was kind of an eye opener for me. Um, You know, when I went there the first time it was 2015. So I would have been like, mid twenties. And at that point in my life, I thought that I was like fat, that my boobs weren't good looking, blah, 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 all these other things. And I went there and I was like, wow, like I felt the most beautiful that I ever did in my life. And that was a big turning point for me because I was able to just be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I love that about being a nudist is that, you know, there's no, a real nudist is not someone who is going to be judgmental about other people's bodies and is not someone who is going to stare at your genitals and your, you know, that's a pervert. Um, So, you know, I have to say, I mean, (laughs) I've had like, (laughs) I've had like both experiences at the nude beach, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's, that's to be expected. But, you know, it's, it's, you know, um, then, of course, you have to handle the situation. But, um, but as you said, like, when I talk to people who are in alignment with uh, these ethics of uh, being a nudist, we don't even, we don't look at each other's genitals. We're like, mm-hmm. we look at each other's eyes when you're talking, you know, we're not there to, like, scrutinize each other's body. And, yeah, so I love that. I love to be able to be, to be free this way and to be myself and to feel like, you know, not to feel safe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So kind of switching gears into what are some ideas that you might have for listeners who are like, Hmm, I think that this resonates with me. Like what are some things they could do to invite more eco-sensuality, more eco-sexuality if they don't really know where to start? Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's a great question. And of course, I have prepared something for you. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I, have, I have five five ideas uh, for our listeners. And uh, all those are, of course, um, also um, uh, exercises that we offer clients uh, in our practice as somatic sex educators. And the first one that I choose is uh, simply a body scan. It's like going into nature and scanning our body head to toes, um, bringing attention to each part and noticing sensations or feelings that arise. And a body scan really helps us become more aware of our body sensation. And so, you know, you can do it outside, you can do it in nature, you can do it seated, you can do it, you do it standing, you can do it lying down. But that's first, you know, that's something that um, help, will help people tune into their sensations. A second exercise that I have is mindful touch. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for this one, you can go in nature and explore different textures and sensations through touch. Mm-hmm. Um, so you like know, feeling different... leaves and stuff. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. Um, okay. you know, using various objects found in nature, like you said, just leaves, stones, tr- tree bark. Yeah. Um, moss, <laughs> moss, moss. Yeah, 
and even the water of a stream or waterfall and then focus on the tactile sensations that yeah. you experience that. One of my favorite leaves to feel is lilac leaves like in spring because they're so soft oh, and yeah. like I like to like put it on my cheek and like yeah. pet my cheek with it. And sometimes I like to put it on my lips for some oh, reason. Yeah. I really like to put leaves on my lips and feel with my uh, lips. Oh, there you go, everyone. Go try that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, touching things that, you know, help develop a deeper awareness of touch. And you can do that alone or you can do that with a partner. You can take turns and have, you know, close your eyes and have your partner like you with some some on um, some tree bark or, or moss on your skin and ooh. and then of course we can't talk about somatic awareness without talking about breath awareness so um you know focusing on the breath and observing its natural rhythm um because when we bring attention to our breath we can anchor ourselves in the present moment and connect with our bodies much better than if we don't pay attention to the way we're breathing. And again, this can be practiced indoors, outdoors, individually, with a partner, um, and you know, to help us tune into the sensations of the breath while surrounded by nature and enjoy all the beautiful sense of that nature has to offer. Mm -hmm. um, Another activity uh, is a sensory walk in nature. You actually brought that up earlier when you were talking about ideas for couples. Yeah, taking a slow and mindful walk in a natural setting, paying attention to the sensory experiences along the way. Um, you know, we can focus on the sights, the sounds, again, the smells, the texture that we encounter, allowing ourselves to fully engage with the environment. Um, and again, you know, that promotes deep connection with nature and cultivates sensory awareness. And the final exercise I have is body movement and dance. You can go out in nature and express yourself. I saw a video yesterday on Instagram of these two girls um, at uh, one of the uh, one of the beaches here. Um, they were wearing their uh, Santa hats. And they were in bathing suits and they were just like dancing, free dancing by the water. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. Um, and I think that video was actually posted to make fun of it. And I was like, there's nothing to be made fun of mm. here. It's two women enjoying their body in nature and, um, and moving their body. And that's a really powerful way to connect with, you know, their body and the natural world as well. Um, you know, we can experience different movements, reasons, and sensations as we move our body freely. Um, that also encourages self-expression, which, of course, we are, uh, most of us, you know, we suppress that. So we're encouraged to suppress self-expression. So dancing, moving your body encourages that, encourages your body awareness. And again, the sense of connection with the surrounding environment. So yeah those are great yeah there's a lot we can do yeah and feel with the the breath one that one's pretty big for me like I'm asthmatic so I always feel like to some degree I am really aware of my breath and like I I am a shallow breather but also my lungs are really sensitive to temperature and climate and oh. where I live is very dry and it goes from really hot, like desert, desert hot to really cold, like minus 30, 40 degrees. And I love to take breaths when I'm in different climates. So if it's really cold out, like taking that breath and like feeling that in my lungs, I'm like, it's so like cold and crisp and it just has such a different feeling. And then, you know, when I was in Louisiana and it, it's, 99% humidity and 41 degrees Celsius. And I take that breath and it's like almost burns like the heat mm -hmm. and feeling that or going to like Phoenix, going to Portland, like every place I travel to when I take a breath and really notice it, it always feels different. 
Mm, that's so cool. And that's due to your to your condition? To Maybe. Your I think I'm just more aware of it. Oh, I see. I see. It helps you being more aware of your of your breath and how yeah. it feels. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm happy you brought that in. Yeah. Hmm. What else do you feel is important to share about ecosexuality, ecosensuality before we kind of start to wrap up this episode? Yeah. Hmm. Let's see. Hmm. I feel like hmm. I think that you know we are all we all responsible for um our well-being and that implies also the well-being of the planet so you know as an ecosensual person also we um we care about you know the ecosystems as i said earlier and um you know we want to make sure that uh, we keep this planet uh in good shape and so I think that's where it really starts. Like ecosensuality starts with being aware of, um, you know, the, the water that we use. So for example, you know, when I take a shower, I never let the water run. Um, when I soap myself, when I wash my hair, I turn the water off and then I turn it on again when I want to rinse off, you know? Um, so like, you know, just being aware of how we, how we treat the planet and how we, um, you know, recycle also. Um, and talking about recycling, I want to um, give resources to our listeners if you're interested in looking into eco um, uh, sensual sex toys. Um, I found this company that's called the Natural, the Natural Love Company, and they use um, they use uh, uh, recycle recycled materials such as uh, uh, plastic, mm-hmm. ocean plastic, and uh-huh. that creates. I know. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So I think, you know, everybody can be um, an ecosensual person once they start paying attention to their, you know, uh, what they consume and then what they, what they excrete, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. Um, it's that simple, you know, Mm -hmm. and then if you want to be a little more adventurous and if you're curious about, you know, taking that to another level and feeling more into your body and your senses and your, your, your sexuality and, you know, just, just do those activities that I mentioned and go in nature and have fun, go frolic with nature. I think one thing we kind of didn't touch on too, that might be worth noting, and this might not be for everybody. I go camping like a lot I because I love being in nature. I love, you know, it's, 10 30 at night and it's still like the sun is setting here we're so lucky and the loons are calling out on the lake and it's warm and my fire is crackling but i also like to microdose so i'll do like microdosing of mushrooms usually Mm -hmm. but that sometimes helps to shift my brain away from like being in the city and like having that experience versus being out like way, way out where I don't even have cell service. And I'm, you know, looking at the water and I'm noticing the glimmers a little bit more vividly. I'm noticing the trees are a little more green. I'm noticing the sunlight sparkling through the branches onto the ground. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes microdosing can help to awaken that part of your brain to nature as well that's the only time I'll do it Mm -hmm. yeah I know there's a lot of uh, somatic sex educators right now that are um, bringing microdosing into their practice Um, and I'm 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 not experienced in that realm Um, I actually don't actually don't do well I've only done it like a couple times <laughs> and for me I've always had like a bad experience so I like try to stay away from it but I do know that for some people it does uh enhances um sensations mm-hmm. uh, so yeah I think you know might be something someone to look into and others won't <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. yeah 
Yeah. Um, like do your research um, right. yeah. about it. And mm-hmm. also like, I definitely wouldn't be bringing it into sessions with clients, but when I'm out camping and it's just my partner and I, and my dog, mm-hmm. you know, doing a little bit and I'm like, wow, mm-hmm. my brain like shifts in mm-hmm. that. And then I go home and I'm able to bring that experience back into being in my backyard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 But I just wanted to touch on that because sometimes it is really beautiful experience. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we're kind of wrapping up here. So Laz, do you want to share where folks can find you? Yeah. Um, I am on Instagram under somatic, um, underscore solas three, three, three. And then, um, I have a website, um, somatic solas.com. And then you can also find me on the, um, websites of the, uh, somatic sex education. Um, what is it? Um, Association. Association. Thank you. (laughs) And anywhere else? Oh, at this moment, no, I'm not a big um, social media person. So the only social media I have is Instagram. That's plenty for me. Um, and yeah, and you know, yeah, go look me up on there and my website and yeah, say, uh, get in touch with me if you have any questions or if you'd like to book a session with me. I'd love to hear from you. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on here today and having this discussion about something that is so fucking hot, but so wildly Uh under-discussed. We need to be talking about this more and spreading the word. Yes, we do. And if you go to my Instagram account, you'll see how I use um, eco-sensuality as an art as well, because I do a lot of a lot of photography outside in nature naked and uh, it's a really beautiful way that I find I find to express myself I love your Instagram everybody go follow (laughs) Salaz no not everybody I'm very selective by the way oh is it a private account (laughs) it is I'm very selective I only set it up on public when I post something new and I only leave it on public for 24 hours but you know just like um just like going to the nude beach and you can always like encounter creeps it's the same on social media right so yes yeah but <laughs> let's um follow me <laughs> but yeah thank you well thank you <laughs> And I want to thank all of my amazing listeners for tuning in to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. If you're looking for more ways to connect, access info, and get social with me, you can follow the show's Instagram at the.sexed.show or my individual Instagram at Sex Ed for the Modern Bed. Until next time, claim your pleasure, own your body, and stay in presence. <laughs>